delighted to welcome everyone to this first in a series of uh, public seminars here at the Education Department in the University of Oxford on the rights of the child. Um, uh, I want to start by, by thanking my colleagues uh, Nika, Manoli and Wiam who have convened this series um, in part as a response. Hi Nika, uh, hi Wiam, hi Manoli. Um, my three colleagues here have co-convened this series with me in part as students last year on the MSc in education uh, on a module I taught on the implementation of the rights of children that focused on the, the question of how policy realizes in practice the goals of the UNCRC. What are the mechanisms for that? Um, but Manoli, Nika and Wiam, uh, amongst others, felt that there were voices, aspects, ideas, perspectives that were missing from that course and that a whole series of wider issues about how the um, issues of rights are understood and play out in different parts of the world in different contexts, how that really operates um, and that we should have a wider discussion about these things. And I'm, I'm delighted that uh, Manoli, Nika and Wiam have, have participated to, to help create this series and they have designed it to, to, to reflect that, that perspective as I've, I've described it. Um, they've asked not to speak today, um, but I'm, I'm delighted to introduce them and I hope they and, and you will enjoy this series um, I particularly want to thank as well the speakers today um, and Lani and the comms team uh, here in the university who've helped organize this such that we're here and I'm delighted to see so many people join us for this discussion and the first as I say in a series of seminars different aspects of the challenges of realizing the rights of children. Um, today we have a, a session that will be chaired by Dr. Naomi Lott, who I'm going to introduce, and then I'll, I'll hand over to Naomi to, to introduce today's session and, and to, to introduce the speakers and to chair for today. Um, I just wanted to say, please do uh, in engage as, as, as audience members in this webinar in the chat, put your questions in the Q&A, and Naomi will, will select from them um, as we go into the discussion. Um, so Dr. Naomi Lott is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Faculty of Law in Oxford University. Um, she's researched the issues of, of child rights, particularly the right to play, um, uh, and has also looked at the issues through from the conception of rights to implementation. So huge amount of relevant learning. Naomi, thank you very much for chairing today. Great to meet you and over to you. Pleasure, thank you for having me. So today's uh, panel is going to be looking at the UNCRC, its role and effectiveness. Um, it's going to be discussing things like the goals and the prospects of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, as well as, the, as providing diverse perspectives on the effectiveness of the CRC. Today, we're going to start with a presentation by Mr. Benjamin Perks, who is the Head of Campaigns and Advocacy in the Division of Global Communications and Advocacy at the UN Children's Fund. He has spent substantial time and get gaining experience working with the UN across the globe, supporting and advocating for the realization of human rights commitments. So no further ado, Benjamin, please go ahead. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. La. It is a pleasure to uh, be with you and such a great panel. Uh, I'm gonna start my uh, talk with two apologies. Firstly, I'm in New York. If there's some noise in the background with sirens, I, I, I apologize for that. But I also apologize for not really being a meticulous scholar of the CRC. I'm rather somebody that has worked with the essence of the CRC throughout my entire working life, which really started as a campaigner, as a teenage campaigner for the rights of young people in care in the UK. The, 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 the development of the CRC led to changes in the legal framework in the UK that protected vulnerable uh, young people. I then went on, and children, and I then went on to work in humanitarian roles in uh, what I would call human rights diplomacy, uh, leading UNICEF or, or, or UN uh, country presences. And now I have the great pleasure and privilege to be able to work on global advocacy uh, at a really challenging time for children's rights in the world. And I think that 
the main thing through this journey that I have seen is that the CRC has brought together uh, the expectation and understanding of rights, whether you're a girl in Afghanistan who is worried about going to school, whether you're a child soldier in Sierra Leone, whether you're a young person in a children's home in the UK, or children that have been exploited by things that we have seen, such as the uh, Ghislaine Maxwell uh, and Epstein trial recently, uh, that these come together in a single story of child rights. And it's a story that really includes every child in the planet and their right to be uh, protected, their right for survival and, and, and for development uh, in, a, in a greater freedom, as we say in the UN. And this is really important because over the three decades since the uh, CRC uh, came into being, the conversation has shifted from one about a charitable framing of helping children, uh, of inputs to uh, and what we can do to help children to a framing around rights, which says that we are all duty bearers, governments are duty bearers to protect, promote and fulfill the rights of children and a focus on outcomes and creating a better world for children. And there is no better example uh, of this than what has been achieved in terms of child survival. In the life of the CRC, child mortality, the number of children that die before the age of five has decreased by 61% in the world. And whenever I think about this, I'm reminded of the way that we often quite rightly commemorate the loss of um, injustice and tragedy, the Holocaust, uh, slavery uh, and other injustices that have taken away lives and people's rights, but we don't often celebrate the fact that on our planet, millions of lives are saved each year because of this amazing uh, human accomplishment and this amazing human endeavor that increased vaccine coverage against the major childhood diseases from 20% to 50 to 80% and really developed a primary healthcare system that, that serves children throughout the world. We also have seen in the life cycle the, um, of the CRC a halving of the number of children uh, out of school. We have uh, seen almost a doubling of the number of children who have access to safe sanitation. We have seen significant declines in uh, things like early childhood marriage, in female genital mutilation, uh, in um, child labor, and we have seen an increase, for example, in the number of countries that legislate against corporal punishment, increasing from three countries in the world in 1990 to 63 countries today. And in, these, uh, in the aggregate, these gains are huge and must be measured against a dramatic increase in population uh, growth. When we come to the question of the effectiveness of the CRC, the big question for me, and I think our colleagues that work here in, in, in UNICEF and the other UN agencies would be, to what extent can we attribute the positive progress for children to, uh, to the CRC? And I'll come back to that later on in the uh, conversation. Uh, while the gains are huge, it's important to note that they have stagnated in the, in the decade prior to uh, the pandemic, and we have had some retrograde steps as a result of COVID-19, which as you all know, has ravaged health systems, schools, and child protection systems. It's not a time for us to be complacent uh, at all. Uh, to remind you that while we talk about progress, we have to remember that 20 million children are born into communities or living communities uh, where nobody has been vaccinated against any major childhood disease. 9% of children remain out of school globally, and 50% of those in school in low and middle income countries are in school but not learning because of poor governance in the school system. 200 uh, million women and girls uh, have been victims of uh, FGM, and 160 million children in the world are involved in child labor. 
more than half of them in hazardous forms of child labor. And the number of verified grave violations of um, human rights in, in, in conflict situations has tripled in the past decade. And one in four children leaving countries affected by conflict or natural disaster with all of the um, impact that has on basic services. And many of those children live in situations where they have a triple crisis of conflict, of climate change, and of uh, COVID-19. Uh, COVID COVID-19 also revealed that 40% of families in the world do not have means of daily hand hygiene. We know that children affected by uh, poverty, discrimination, by adverse childhood experiences, and humanitarian crisis are least likely to have their rights fulfilled. And that that is likely now in this day and age to lead to lifelong poor outcomes and that those poor outcomes are intergenerational. Uh, and as James Heckman, the Chicago University Nobel Prize winning economist has stressed, investment in preventing all of this yields the biggest return that any public investment can provide. It remains a really important time, even for those people that don't care about human rights, to recognize that investment uh, in, in, in protecting child rights is essential for the economic, social, and democratic development of any society. Of course, the CRC, when we think about the role of the CRC, it gives a framework for legal reform and for reporting on progress with clear and measurable targets to a dedicated UN committee and hearing their recommendations for further progress. Almost all middle and low income countries in the world have five year programs with the United Nations where they try to advance on all of the human rights treaties with the dedicated support of agencies like UNICEF, UNHCR and UNDP in country. Uh, there are also regional bodies, the African Union, the European Union have dedicated uh, prof professionals who uh, dedicated focal points who contribute at a regional level to driving forward implementation uh, and fulfillment and protection of the CRC. Of course, as the CRC has, uh, has been with us, many countries have also developed independent commissioners or ombudspersons to monitor at the, uh, at, the, at the national level progress on the CRC. And, and, and we, uh, you know, we call all of this human rights architecture. It is a global interdependent system, which is, enables us over time to deliver progress for children everywhere. And it's important to remember for a moment that often that human rights architecture has happened because people have fought bravely for human rights, often at the barrel of a gun in parts of the world where speaking out for human rights is something that is not very easy or very comfortable to do. And I think we should all be proud to be part of a community that, that has shown such courage in driving this agenda forward. The CRC was born at a time of, of real optimism and hope. Uh, those who are old enough to remember it was when Nelson Mandela was released and, and, and the uh, apartheid era came to an end where the Cold War was over, the, the World Wide Web was uh, beginning to, uh, to take hold. And there was a sense of um, universalism and almost a global common good, which meant that um, UN uh, political parties at national level, regional bodies could talk about things like children's rights uh, and have an agreement across constituencies, across socially conservative, liberal, socialist constituencies, where everybody could agree on what uh, the set of basic rights and international goals could be without fragmenting political constituencies or losing political capital. I feel, and this is really a bit of a personal view, but I think many would agree with me, that part of the effectiveness of UN human rights has been undermined in the past decade uh, by a retreat of universalism uh, and the growing of uh, or development of polarizing ideologies uh, where rights are more attached to identity and action is focused on more symbolic than more symbolic things than, than, than things that can really change the well-being and lives of our population. And I think that runs parallel to the stagnation in the decade prior to the pandemic 
of some of the gains for uh, for children that we saw in the in the decades, particularly the decades before the uh, global economic crisis. I believe very strongly from experience that you only really achieve positive gain in social, economic, democratic development when you can really come with an idea that brings uh, brings people uh, together. I just want to share a couple of practical experiences in the way that we work in the UN. Uh, firstly, that when we do a pitch uh, with the government to, uh, to, to, to implement a piece of legislation or, or, or an investment in something that will contribute to the rights of children, we never just talk about the CRC, though it's an important part of that work. We also demonstrate through economic arguments, through evidence, through health data, sometimes also by aligning with other processes, World Bank and for example, EU accession processes to really build a compelling multifaceted case on why it's important to invest in that polio campaign, that expansion of preschool, that deinstitutionalization process. So the CRC is part of a suite of tools that we use to advance the rights of children. And like anything else, the gains that we see are not solely attributable to the CRC, but the CRC is a really important part of it. And without the CRC, I don't think we would have the gains that we, that, that we have in the world for children. A um, couple of other points. I think challenge is moving forward. The world is changing. Population growth, just to give an example, we need an extra 1.3 million teachers in Africa to keep the present level of progress uh, in the uh, school system because of population growth. We have the challenge of climate change, where every country will need to have a climate adaptation plan to maintain the existing gains in the context of uh, climate, climate change. I think uh, the pandemic has really shown the, also the, the, the interdivisibility issue of children's rights. Uh, for example, how do we balance uh, how do we balance the right of a child to health, the importance of ending the pandemic for children in general, uh, and also uh, ensuring that schools remain open? And these kind of issues are mutually reinforcing and require really complex thinking about how do we message and build shared values about how we achieve these things together. Finally, I'd say that. The other challenge is for the, the, the implementation of the CRC to run alongside our improving understanding of, uh, of child development. We know much more about adverse childhood experiences, about toxic stress, about the social and emotional development of children, about how children learn because of breakthroughs in science. And this is, this is all great news because it better enables us to address long-standing challenges to children's rights, but we need to make sure that we have a conversation between the people generating this science and the people working uh, to, uh, to implement children's rights. So in the final verdict, has the CRC been effective to my original question about contributing to this progress? I would say we can attribute partial causality to the CRC in creating a much better world for children. However, there is so much work to be done until you know to, to really do the finished business of the CRC. And I hope that all of us will, all of you will help us in that journey to really build a world that's truly fit for children. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Benjamin, and thank you for for sticking perfectly for to time. That's really impressive. <laughs> um, so we're going to move on to our second presentation um, today and we'll take questions at the end. Um, so our second presentation today will be given by Professor David Archard. Um, David Archard is the Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at Queen's Belfast. His work on childhood, family and ethics are central key texts for anyone studying children's rights, family law, childhood studies, and it is a real honour to have him share his wisdom with us today. So uh, with no further ado, thank you very much, David, for joining us. Thank you very much indeed, Naomi, for those very kind words. Uh, and I'm very pleased and honoured to be here myself. What I thought I would do is give a presentation that uh, is essentially my reflections as a philosopher on the UNCRC and hope to be a little bit provocative about 
about it. And I should stress that the book I wrote some years ago on children was an attempt to explore how children and childhood were understood within history, law, anthropology, and politics, as well as philosophy, and out of that construct uh, a better understanding of children. So what are the pluses and minuses of uh, the UNCRC? Firstly, it is a global legal instrument that has made a huge difference to and improved the lives of children everywhere in the world by obliging states to attend to and promote the welfare of children, doing so both in its own right and through those uh, additional protocols in its wake. And I think Benjamin's presentation was a very eloquent statement of the extraordinary practical significance of the CRC in this respect. Yet its influence on domestic law and policy is very varied across jurisdictions. And if you contrast it, for example, uh, with the European Convention on Human Rights, which is enforced by a European Court of Human Rights, there is, in the case of the CRC, no court to which breaches of the convention can be brought and adjudicated. And there is variable practice in terms of whether or not CRC is incorporated into domestic law. It is not in the case of the UK. It is in other places such as uh, Norway. However, I've always said that whatever one's philosophical views about whether children have rights, and if so, which ones, and I think it's important to recognize there's a great deal of disagreement within philosophy, moral and political philosophy about those questions, there is very great practical reason to welcome the UNCRC for the role it has played in promoting uh, the welfare of children. So how does the UNCRC think about children? What contribution has it made as a document to our conceptualization of childhood and of children? In the first case, and I think Benjamin opened with this important remark, the CRC gives rights to children wherever they live in the world. Uh, they all have the same rights. And that is an extremely important global principle of equality. The CRC also most obviously thinks of children as entitled to uh, possess certain rights. And that again is extremely important because I think prior to the CRC, making the case for children as the possessors of rights was a difficult one. But then crucially, um, children possess rights because they're different from adults and the CRC thinks they should be treated differently from adults. And it says that should be the case because as it famously says by reason of its uh, immaturity, the child needs special safeguards and care. So children are both possessors of rights as are adults, but they're possessors of different rights from adults. And that's because they are different essentially from children. And that means that a child is thought to suffer very particular harms uh, and abuses as a child, which the CRC rights seek to prevent. And as I think what is a very different point, they need the protection of adults against those harms. So the child, according to the CRC, may merit protection rights, those rights that protect it against harms and abuses, be, but be unable to exercise those rights. Those rights may be ones that have to be exercised on their behalf by uh, adults. This, I think, is very familiar to everybody who writes about uh, and thinks about the CRC. And that is, it's conventional to characterize children's rights as falling under three categories that are summarized as the three P's, provision, protection, and participation rights. And there's a very nice summary here from Garrison, Garrison Lansdowne, um, summarizing what those different rights are. So basically provision rights within the uh, convention give children rights to certain levels of uh, health, education, social security, uh, to family life, to recreation, to culture and leisure. And what we're talking about is providing children with certain 
goods. Protection rights are those rights within the convention that identify the rights of children to be safe from bad treatment, from discrimination, from physical and sexual abuse, from exploitation, and from exposure to conflict. And finally, there are the participation rights, which are very much like adult civil and political rights. And those are the rights, essentially, and I want to look at this in some detail, to be consulted, to have a say, uh, to a freedom to express their opinions and um, make certain decisions. So I have long argued that there is a very difficult and central tension within uh, the UNCRC. And that is between promoting the interests of the child and according the child a right to have a say as what shall be done to them and for them. And that's a tension because essentially promoting the interests of the child is paternalistic. It's doing what we think is good for the child, whatever the child thinks, whereas protecting the right to have a say is giving the child a voice in what happens to them and uh, what shall be done to them. And that tension is most obviously expressed in what some see as the two most central and key articles of the UNCRC. So Article 3 uh, argues that the best interests of the child shall be a primary consideration. And we picky philosophers like to point out at this point that the P word here is primary, uh, not paramount. Um, if you look at the UK Children Act, there you will find the welfare of the child uh, being identified as a paramount consideration that is um, the most important and overwhelming one, whereas the Convention only states it's a primary consideration. And I understand in the drafting of the Convention, there were those who favoured paramount, but primary won out. And then one of the great articles of the Convention, Article 12, to the child who is capable of forming his or her views, the right to express those views freely in all matters affecting uh, the child, with those views being given a due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. Um, now, since the Convention is very clear and explicit in its preamble and its wording, the child has all those rights equally that are listed throughout the convention. So there can be no question in principle of one of those two considerations having a greater priority or weight over the other. We must both think of the best interests of the child as primary, but we must also give the child the right to express views on matters affecting it and then weighing those um, views according to age and maturity. Now, let me, lest this all seems terribly uh, abstract, give you a very clear practical example. And on my first slide, I identified myself as I am as a member of the Clinical Ethics Committee of Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital, one of the great children's hospitals in the world. And one of the issues we have there is how to, in making medical decisions for children in very difficult cases, uh, how do we balance uh, promoting the interest of the child with recognizing the fact that the child has a voice. So let me take an example of a 14 year old who states that she doesn't want to the proposed medical procedure that the doctors and her patients, both a parent, sorry, both agree is in her best interest. How do we do what affects her interest and at the same time give due weight to her views on a matter that affects her? And she stated those views. Now, just to be clear, this is not a case of what is called Gillick competence. Those who know their law will know that this is a key principle in new English law, whereby children under the age of consent to medical treatment, that is under the age of 16, who are deemed sufficiently mature to make a decision by virtue of their understanding of the matter under consideration, shall be deemed competent to choose, and they would have all the rights that an adult does. We can also agree that in this case, what is in her interest is not indeterminate or somehow controversial, and we can understand it very broadly. So in most medical decision making, we consider the interests of a child, not simply in health or medical terms, but also taking into account other factors such as, uh, for instance, family life. And we can agree that in this case, the procedure is what is in the best interests of the child. Uh, it's, let's say it saves her life. 
And here we might have a conflict between interests and voice, since although we agree it's in her best interest, the child says, no, I don't want it. It's not enough, it seems to me, to say that hearing the child is in her interests. And I've heard this argued in various places that somehow um, attending to the views of the child is an element of best interest. So there's no conflict between uh, articles three and 12, because what matters in a case like this is not simply for the child that she's heard and that uh, her voice is listened to, but her voice makes a difference. It might change what is done to her. Again, the child uh, in wanting something that is not in her interest is not there by revealing herself that she lacks any uh, maturity or rationality, and thus we discount her voice. We just don't listen to her. So some I've heard say, well, if what she wants is so obviously not in her interest, then we shouldn't listen to her because she is not competent to express a view on what matters to her. And what the child expresses a view on is not of value simply because in hearing what she wants, we get a better understanding of her interests and probable dispositions. So some judges in Gillick cases have said, look, you should not discount a child's oppos opposition to a medical procedure because no doctor wants to be put in the position of forcing or coercing a child, making a child compliant um, so that she has the procedure where she's resisting it. Given all of that, it remains for me and others very puzzling what exactly is meant by waiting a child's voice and how exactly once we understand what it means, we might give appropriate weight. So let me, having sped through those matters, give you some concluding thoughts. Those of us who think about children, childhood and children's rights need to be able to understand what the difference between children and adults is. And we need to do so in a manner that we do protect children and do what is best for children, but recognize their distinctive nature as not being simply less than and not yet adults. A classic view of children is you define them by opposition to adults, they're everything adults are not. Rather, we need to understand what children are in their own right. And that's often expressed in the language of saying we should recognize them not just in their becoming, but in their being. And in particular, we need to recognize that children cannot be, as adults are, uh, self-determining choosers of, the, as of their own life. They don't yet have that capacity. Yet we need to respect them as having their own independent and particular perspective and set of wishes about their own lives. The UNCRC seems to me extraordinarily valuable in framing that absolutely crucial matter without completely spelling out what exactly that means. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, David. That's plenty of food for thought for us for, for, for today. Thank you so much. Um, so we're next gonna hear from uh, Dr. Conrad Nayamutata, who is senior lecturer in law and the head of research students at De Montfort University. Conrad is a specialist in the field of children and armed conflict and his insight to philosophical issues surrounding international law are also most welcome. So thank you very much for joining us today, Conrad. Uh, for inviting me to, uh, to this conference. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear me. Um, now, I think I, I, I would like to approach uh, this topic slightly differently from uh, uh, the others so far. Uh, I believe my invitation to this conference was based on um, an article that I wrote with a colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Faulkner, uh, entitled uh, The Decolonization of Children's Rights uh, and the Colonial Contours of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, which was published in the International Journal of Children's Rights. Now, we tried to use decolonization. Uh, sorry, I think I might have disappeared. Uh, we tried to use decolonization as an analytical tool 
uh, for our children's rights and also the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Uh, of course, I'll be speaking, speaking to people who already know or the converted, if I may say so. Uh, when I speak to uh, the host is Oxford, uh, because you are known for your well-publicized activities around decolonization uh, of the curriculum and others. And it is in the same spirit uh, that we wrote uh, this article. Along, of course, with other theoretical sort of uh, lenses, such as uh, the third world uh, approaches to international law uh, and the uh, cultural relativism. Uh, these are sort of kind of tools that we thought maybe would be useful uh, in examining uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and Children's Rights in, in general. The other objective behind uh, writing this article was also to try and address the pedagogy of children's rights. How do we teach children's rights as the scholars of uh, uh, children's uh, rights and the international international law. Now, the critique uh, of uh, uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, and Children's Rights uh, falls within the broader inquiry uh, on the genealogy of uh, international law and human rights, which focuses on the concept uh, of uh, human rights itself. Uh, what is it? Uh, and uh, uh, we, we know that it is premised on the idea of uh, universality, and we've already heard about that uh, from earlier uh, speeches, and that it is normative. Um, and also the context uh, that these norms uh, have to ap apply to billions of people in diverse societies. And the content itself is about certain values, uh, particularly highlighting the idea of individual uh, rights. Now, when it comes to the decolonization of uh, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, applying those same three Cs, uh, concept, content, and uh, context, is that uh, the idea of a childhood itself is not universal. Uh, I think this is a, a, a nothing, nothing new. And the context is that children's rights do not reflect the diverse values, do not fully reflect these diverse values. Uh, and the argument we are proposing is that the content is quite Eurocentric and not fully inclusive, okay? And there's some uh, literature which sort of uh, uh, begs those uh, arguments. So in our arguments uh, with uh, Elizabeth, we were saying that uh, decolonizing children's rights provides a unique lens to reframe our approach uh, to both the convention and children's rights uh, more generally. So we sought to challenge the perception that the UNCRC creates a framework of children's rights that adequately represents uh, all children uh, in the world. And we set out an argument that scholarship on children's rights needs to be disentangled from the hege hegemonic Western epistemologies if it is to remain relevant. And that is the key argument that we're making in uh, in our discussion. Now, just to try and uh, analyze uh, some of the procedural uh, and also contextual issues around the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Alternative expressions that seek to explain the success of the UNCRC in terms of uh, ratification, because we all know that the UNCRC is the most widely ratified treaty in the world. So alternative suggestions suggest that there was an ulterior motive, an ulterior impetus to the ratification than the full commitment of children uh, uh, to children's rights. For instance, it was suggested that there was a belief that ratification would actually improve the international standing uh, of ratifying states. 
uh, um, this is probably not surprising in my view that uh, most states would want to be seen uh, to protect uh, the rights uh, of, of children. Uh, whether this is done in practice is another matter. But the whole idea of being seen and have a sense of belonging uh, was also a motivation to ratify the treaties, the treaty rather. And also the ratification sort of was motivated by this idea of uh, aid that many African countries uh, rushed to ratify the UNCRC, assuming that uh, through ratification, this would create a legitimate road to access uh, uh, aid. And others associate the UNCRC uh, with uh, a new cultural uh, imperialism. And I will talk a little bit more about, about that uh, later. So when we think about this concept of uh, universality itself, which applies, which implies that uh, children's rights apply to every child uh, in the world. To some extent, uh, the idea of universality itself is uh, sort of mythical in the chimera itself. In that some of those rights are unreachable to some children in other parts of the world because of the economic disparities between the global north and the, uh, the global south in particular. So it is almost impossible to have a universal expression of, for example, economic rights espoused in the UNCRC uh, because of these interminable disparities. Of course, we've heard of, uh, from Benjamin's wonderful uh, presentation uh, about uh, the successes uh, that uh, could partially be attributed to the UNCRC. And indeed, there have been uh, some successes which we cannot uh, ignore. But the very fact uh, of uh, economic inequalities means that children may not enjoy universal rights. In other parts of the world, children will be able to access school, health, uh, et cetera, whilst in others, uh, those rights may not be accessible. The other elements that uh, we can talk about is this idea of uh, reservations. Uh, I'm sure we all understand that uh, under treaty law, uh, states are allowed to enter reservations to provisions that they may not want to accept. And there is a significant number of reservations, particularly from the Islamic set of states. What it means is that, again, the idea of universality is, is to be questioned because it means that in, in other parts of the world, children can enjoy certain rights, whilst in other places, uh, children cannot enjoy those uh, same rights. So while it is a tool uh, for accommodation in international law, reservations, as I said, mean that there is a disparity in the enjoyment of rights uh, between children across uh, uh, the globe. And just to look at some of the sort of dilemmas uh, that have also been encountered by the United Nations uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child. Uh, for instance, the issue of child marri marriages. Uh, well, the truth is that child marriages are still permitted in some Western states uh, at 16, uh, and in some places even younger, uh, in exceptional circumstances, it is said, uh, and the decision has to be made by a judge uh, on the evidence of maturity of, uh, of the children. But when this kind of marriage is okay, somewhere else, say in the global south, uh, they are greeted with uh, a sense of uh, uh, revulsion uh, and abhorrence, uh, perhaps even attached to sentiments of uh, a primordial sort of society. 
Uh, yet these sort of marriages are also endorsed in, 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 in Western societies. There's also the issue of uh, circumcision of boys. Uh, the question is, is, it, is circumcision uh, a violence or a violation of uh, physical uh, integrity? Uh, in the case of Israel, the Committee on the Rights of the Child does not uh, condemn Israel to, uh, to stop the practice of uh, circumcision, but only to carry out a, a study uh, on the effects of uh, uh, circumcision. Uh, Almost associated with that is the issue that has been raised earlier on. I think it was Benjamin who mentioned uh, uh, female uh, genital mutilation. Uh, in some parts of the world, uh, FGM is uh, criminalized. Okay, uh, here in the UK, it is criminalized. In, the, in 2019, I think, the UK had its first prosecution for a person who uh, allowed uh, FGM on their on their on their child, but there is also uh, female genital cosmetic surgery, which, according to evidence, results in almost similar harms to uh, FGM. But if you look at the trend in the application of the law, you find that it is doctors who have committed, uh, who have perpetrated or carried out FGM, who have been brought before the courts and not those that commit, uh, that have perpetrated or carried out uh, female genital cosmetic surgery. And yet, as uh, that article I, I, I quote there, uh, and there's also even more evidence that the damage that is caused uh, to genitalia is the same. And by the way, the FGM that I have referred to, the prosecutions uh, are carried out under uh, clinical conditions as well. And the other issue, of course, uh, is uh, child labor. Uh, again, there was reference uh, to this. Um, uh, part of the regime uh, of child labor includes the minimum age convention uh, of 1973, which is essentially abolitionist. Uh, it says that uh, work is allowed at the age of 15 and 13 for light work. And uh, under those ages, uh, work is, is, is actually not, uh, not allowed. Uh, and uh, according to Kirsten Sandbeck, uh, of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, at a Congress that they held in Mexico, they were confronted by children and she called what happened a vivid discussion with those adolescents and children, and some as young as 18, who were insisting on their rights to actually work and support their families. And the research which has been conducted recently has shown that children can actually do work and also go to school. And that these are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, so in such contexts, uh, education is regarded as an activity to actually fit around other aspects of life, especially work. Okay. So these are just a few examples of uh, the areas uh, when we talk about the effectiveness and the roles I think it is also important to try and pay attention uh, to the challenges and the difficulties that uh, the convention uh, and, and those that implement it uh, are can face. Anurad, if I could invite you to start to wrap up, that would be fantastic. Oh, okay. So the, the moral crusades to uh, save an individual right? Uh, 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 in the third world, presumed to underpin the UNCRC, also ignores the fact that Africa has always respected uh, children's rights. So the idea that children's rights are something that just came from the West uh, is uh, not uh, correct. And this is one of the reasons also why the African Charter on the Rights of the Child was drafted. 
the UNCRC focuses on individual rights, whereas the African Charter on the Rights uh, of a Child is much more collectivist and communalist. Um, so I, I'm just rushing now because uh, I have to conclude by saying there's an inherent need to challenge the multi, multiple power dynamics that exist within the field and uh, to centralize the legacy of colonialism within critiques of uh, international legal action that has been implemented to address the rights of children. The decolonial theory is premised on the de-emphasis of Western knowledge and modes of conception of the world. So the Eurocentric history of human rights does not need to be discarded or prohibited within human rights discourse and education, but decolonial theory suggests engagement with other conceptions uh, in order to remove itself from either this monologue. Uh, so it seeks to transform Western colonial epistemologies by stressing the importance of creating space for cultural, political, and social memories. Okay, so that's uh, my, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Conrad. Thanks. Um, so our next presentation is going to be given by Amisa Teagle. Uh, Amisa is a lawyer with 15 years experience in constitutional and family law. She is also co-founder of the Muslim Personal Reform Action Group and has significant experience in law reform. We're very excited to see what you have to say to the, today um, to us, Amisa. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's very nice to be with you this evening. Uh, I was really happy to listen in on the very interesting presentations that took place before me, uh, learned a lot. Um, I think that moving on from those presentations, my one will be different in, in the fact that we are bringing these global or more broad these broader ideas to a very local context. So I'll be speaking about my own experience in working on issues relating to children and working with the CRC in Sri Lanka. I need uh, um, for that to put the context uh, to you. Uh, and I also want to say that even in talking about these issues, my experience will be limited or this presentation will be limited to the rights of the child in relation to a minority community. So child rights in Sri Lanka, I can, I can say with confidence, is a low priority subject, right, um, of political and policy conversations. Um, there are many areas of the CRC, even in the 2018 report, uh, highlighting these large bodies of work that need to be done in Sri Lanka whether it's violence, including corporal punishment, sexual exploitation, abuse, um, economic exploitation, including child labor, administration of juvenile justice, and reconciliation, truth and justice as part of our post-war uh, years uh, and experience that we are dealing with. It is in that very broad context of very many issues relating to children in Sri Lanka that we, I am going to talk about engaging on child rights with the minority population of Muslims. Uh, it focuses on uh, the challenges that we have had in raising these issues and the silences that have been there and are very difficult to shift uh, in relation to these issues. Um, I think it's safe to say that the lack of political will to, to move on child rights in Sri Lanka and the very lackadaisical institutional approaches to progress are, are big boulders that hinder our work. Um, just to set in context, Sri Lanka is a majority singular Buddhist population. So the Muslim population is just less than 10%. Uh, the Muslim population also must be understood to be diverse along lines of sect and political ideology. As a minority population, the Muslim community faces numerous forms of discrimination and oppression. So we've, we've experienced communal riots, arbitrary arrests and detentions under the prevention of terrorism laws, policies, um, even as recently under the, under the pandemic, uh, where COVID bodies of Muslims were forcibly cremated, which is against their uh, religious and cultural practice. Um, and there is this ongoing policy discourse on controls on the Muslim community 
and religious practice, which bears down on the community. It is in this context that we are looking then at the rights of children in Muslim families. And we're looking at how they are framed and how they are articulated. So I'm going to talk about two different experiences. One is uh, my work with a group that uh, was mentioned in my introduction, uh, Muslim Law Personal Reform Action Group, um, which lobbies for the reform of Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act in Sri Lanka. It is a law that governs personal law, marriage and divorce, and some other issues as well. 1951, the law comes into being. It's a piece of colonial legislation. And in it, it has a provision that says a girl under the age of 12 to be is, is permitted to be married with the permission of the Kazi, who is a, is a judge of sorts. Um, that relates then also to penal code provision that reduces the age of statutory rape for Muslim girls to 12, recognizing child wives. Uh, the second issue that I want to talk a little bit about is engagement with women affected by FGM and mothers in communities practicing FGM. Both of these will highlight the very many challenges we face in raising issues even to the CRC from within our context. So on the question of minimum age, the lived reality is really suppressed, right? Um, for example, the national data does not clarify whether early marriages recorded relating to the Muslim community, uh, what those statistics are. And this is because legally in the law, there is no minimum age of marriage for Muslims. So for example, a study in 2013 said that field researchers found it extremely difficult to obtain information on early marriages or statutory rape from within the Muslim com community. Officials who were interviewed claimed that although these incidents were prevalent within the communities, they were not reported. On the other hand, gaining access to Muslim communities to speak about such sensitive topics within a short time was not possible for that study. It, again, we, we will look then at the communities and the community-based organizations working on these issues and documenting these cases. And we noticed that there were very serious challenges, not just from state institutions, which is a consequence of racism and patriarchy, uh, but also from the community institutions and leadership um, and immense also social challenges against the work that they were doing, whether it was providing support to child brides or victims of domestic abuse who were also children. So testimonies of child brides then were documented to speak of this domestic violence, this dropping out of school, the teenage pregnancies and the eventual destitution these children faced. In engaging in advocacy and amplifying voices of victims and lived realities, we came across two, two major pushbacks. One was from within the community for rep misrepresenting the community, airing dirty linen in the open, and often asked this question, are there really so many underage marriages in the community? Um, then again, the pushback from the state, we can't do anything with about this issue without the community actually agreeing on what needs to be done. So the community leaders then play a very group, very large role in deciding uh, how to tackle this issue or if to tackle this issue at all. So the subtext there from the state is really that child rights are not a priority. Also from media institutions and public political personalities, what we noticed was stories that highlighted Muslims as a bad community gained traction for very different reasons, um, nationalist agendas, as opposed to reacting to these stories or these cases with, with ideas of solutions. Um, so for example, if we look at the uh, state report in 2016 that Sri Lanka presented to the UNCRC, it says, the Muslim Marriages and Divorce Act does not specify a minimum age of marriage and efforts to reach a consensus with the Sri Lankan Muslim community 
on reforming this law has not yielded positive results as yet. This reliance on the community to decide where within that community, women's voices are also not heard and children's voices even less was a very, it, it was something that could not be overcome at that time. Even to raise the case studies and to talk about these, these lived realities, the hardest thing was to bring to, to the public space these stories because victims themselves could not come out in the open. We have very many experiences of victims either being harassed or having to even flee their villages and homes after appearing on, uh, or even with the anonymization that takes place, um, having that kind of violent backlash to talking about their experiences. Um, so this, rea this conversation that we as activists have then had with the CRC, we see that every time we report, there's a little bit more that we are able to then add to the concluding observations next time around, but it is a very slowly evolving building story. Uh, we have to overcome the obstacle domestically to even get part of that story out there and recognized. So for example, in 2010, the concluding observations of the UNCRC said, the committee's report said that the committee notes the creation of a special committee to study a possible revision of personal laws. It is however concerned that the state party considers that any reform of personal laws should come from the affected communities themselves. So there is an acknowledgement of the challenge. Um, in 2018, the committee reported that the state party ought to expeditiously increase the minimum age of marriage for all to 18 years of age without exceptions, including by amending Article 16, which is a law that prevents citizens from raising constitutional issues, rights related issues in relation to existing laws. What the committee that was looking into this issue at the time, um, the, the domestic committee appointed by the government in 2018 said was as a recommendation that they would fix the minimum age at 18. However, for those individuals who wanted to marry between 16 and 18, that would be permissible with the permission of the Qazi, which is a Muslim judge. Um, and again, this, this recommendation came out of nowhere. There was no evidence that supported that this would address issues, particularly when we were able to demonstrate that many of the underage marriages reported, and this is of those, who, and those cases that actually managed to get reported, right? Uh, many of those were between the ages of 16 and 18. We saw figures as high as 88% of the underage marriages in Colombo being between 16 and 17 year olds. Um, so this kind of back and forth, even within the communities debating and looking for consensus before coming to a, a decision about all or law reform really uh, creates a situation where this is not about the child. This is about the, the politics, the between within the community and within the minority and majority communities. Similarly, and I'll not go into too much detail and I'll give the links if anyone is interested, was the issue of FGM, where when we started work on talking about FGM in Sri Lanka, categorically we were told FGM does not take place in Sri Lanka. So the number of official reports concluded without evidence that the practice was non-existent uh, WHO report on gender-based violence in 2008 reported a zero score for female genital mutilation in Sri Lanka. UNICEF's national report card on essential indicators relevant to maternal and child health in Sri Lanka in 2005 also stated that FGM remained nil. Similarly, there were very many such statistics. So when we started talking, we realized women who had experienced it as children and who had the memory of it 
wanted to talk about it, but that was a very, very small uh, number of women from also a very particular community where the practice was done when the girl child was at seven years of age. For all others, also mainly within uh, the Muslim community, and it, it varies from sect to sect, uh, it is done a few, few days after birth or a few months perhaps after birth and children do not remember this experience at all. And it is only when uh, girl children also become mothers that they ask and they know that this happens to them. Um, when we started talking to women about these experiences, we realized how difficult it is, what it was to talk about it, to raise it, to ask questions about it. It was not a topic um, that they would speak about even within their families. And this then was the silence that had been there throughout these years, not raising this issue, not bringing this issue into a public domain where something could be done. It was a few years, 2016, 17, 18, where women started talking about it. Again, the backlash was fairly severe, uh, but due to medical professionals, particularly in the public health sector, recognizing uh, that they're and, and doing examinations and, and listening to women, there was a circular by the Ministry of Health that said that at least the state medical officer should not engage in this practice, which was the one thing that has been, has sort of, um, uh, sort of successfully been done in response to this issue. Um, I remember in, in a report that was written in 2008, which I was uh, one of the authors of in the Ceylon Medical Journal, uh, the author said this work on recognizing FGM in Sri Lanka, this work was promoted by the personal account of a professional colleague who courageously revealed her experience and that of her daughters of female genital mutilation. However, our anxiety is about bringing to attention this practice and the potential professional and social backlash inhibit our submission. These are by medical professionals. Um, Major, if you're able to wrap up, that would be fantastic. Yes. Um, so the, the concluding observations for the CRC in 2008 for the very first time as a result, referred to FGM and recommended a ban uh, of uh, female circumcision for girls, particularly of the Dawu Dibora community in, in Sri Lanka. Um, and, and with that, basically, I, I can wrap up to say that it's these immense hardships and these silences about talking about harms to children that really are difficult to shake in engaging also with the CRC on these issues. And, and the question really is, how do we create spaces that uh, allow the conversations to happen, particularly when those affected communities are under attack or are so marginalized from a civic life, right? And this evolving conversation that activists have with the UNCRC, how can we make that a lot more effective? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amiza. Thank you to all of our panelists for such uh, fascinating and um, really detailed dis, uh, presentations. We've had a number of fantastic questions come through. Um, I'm going to start by asking our panelists to reflect on this um, issue of Western versus universalism um, of, of the convention, because this is a question that has come up a lot um, um, during the presentations. I want to ask if I can, Benjamin, to start. Um, Benjamin, I want to ask you about your experience on the ground. Obviously, you have such a global experience with your work um, about how you found this tension between the Western, uh, Western background of the UNCRC versus the universalism of the UNCRC and whether you see this reflected on the ground or um, it, it kind of to what extent and, and how that may, may be um, in, in your experience, if, if that's okay. I will try. Um, in terms of uh, working in countries, I think that we do human rights diplomacy, and I think that the we see the CRC and the development goals, which are globally agreed. They're not. They're not uh, just Western countries that have developed them. They we we see them as providing a basic framework through which then implementation has to be built 
on local cultural and economic resource base uh, reality. So I think that I, I, I think that on the ground, I've never really felt pushback from uh, partners or governments or, or other constituencies on the notion of universality. I think indeed people find it a relief that if you're going to talk about, um, I don't know, let's take an example, child abuse um, in Tanzania, the fact that it's just as much of an issue in the UK as it is in North America or, in, or anywhere else in the world, in a way, gives people more space to open up difficult conversations. So I think in that sense, universality serves us well. And universality also um, is good in terms of setting targets. I think the difference between the SDGs and the MDGs, all of which were human rights based, and the CRC was an important part of that, they are now putting demands and expectations on high income countries to deliver results as well. And I think that's, uh, that's good progress. And I think every major issue that we seek to deal with through the CRC, um, the prevention of disease, access to school, prevention of violence and its impact on child trauma, these are largely passed through the same frameworks and pathways um, of humanity. Uh, the, 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 for example, addressing polio in Afghanistan, in the UK or in Western Africa would be is the, is the same issue. So I think in implementation, the cultural sensitivity is, uh, is really important. I think if we wrote the CRC today, uh, it would be different. It would be uh, taking into account more, um, you know, more of the more of the, uh, of the, 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 the cultural complexity. But I think you have to accept it for what it is, which is a basic universal framework out of which governments, communities and societies can build what's right for them to achieve the goals that are foreseen. Thanks. Thank you, Benjamin. That's really uh, great to get that insight. Um, it's certainly something I've grappled with with, with my research being um, on the child's right to play. Often I get told that it's a luxury right, it's a Western right, whereas actually when you look at the drafting history of the convention, it was a, a proposed by Mexico, Peru and Romania and was pushed back against by lots of Western countries. And for example, Saudi Arabia said, no, we need this right because otherwise um, you know, that the wealthy uh, countries can have the luxury rights such as play and rest and leisure, whereas um, that the rest of the world only get education and health. So it is a really interesting and um, polarizing debate. Uh, David would like to come back in on this if, if you're happy to do so, go ahead. Yeah, sure. I thought that there were a couple of very interesting questions about the, the universality of um, uh, the UNCRC and the uh, uh, possibility of insensitivity to national cultural differences. Of course, the great strength of human rights is precisely because it's universal. Uh, it applies to all human beings wherever they are. So I think uh, one shouldn't discount, first of all, that as its enormous uh, value and achievement. However, I, I was really interested by um, Conrad's very good talk. And I suppose I, I wanted to be clear what kinds of criticisms might be made. I mean, one was that the drafting of the convention um, involved a kind of uh, exploitation and bribing, bribing of um, delegates from southern countries who agreed perhaps to um, parts of the convention they wouldn't otherwise have done. And I was going to ask Conrad to answer the question that Edward Waller put in there, which is which rights within the UNCRC would he object to and not want to see there? And I've, I just looked at the African Charter on Welfare of Rights of the Child, and it's remarkably similar to the UNCRC. Um, a second kind of criticism is that some of the wording of the rights uh, might be seen as uh, objectionable. As I understand in the drafting, um, the crucial right of a child to choose which religion to practice was objected to by some who felt that it was insensitive um, uh, and not sufficiently uh, protecting of the rights of uh, religious communities and again that might be criticism and the last one that you, you've alluded to alluded to Nemi as a um, another one is actual national implementation of rights may differ widely that is if you're talking about things like a right to education uh, or the right to the highest level of health care or the right to a standard of living sufficient for the adequate development of the child that may be a lot more difficult to protect those rights in, in countries that uh, suffer poverty 
and where there are significant measures of global inequality. So I think you just need to, to separate and spell out what the criticisms are of the universality of uh, the, the CRC rights. Thank you, David. Um, Conrad, if I could ask you to come in on this broader issue of Western versus um, un universalism um, with the CRC. Um, one question that was posed was um, surrounding, if you were to look at a decolonized version of the UN CRC, which articles do you see as unacceptable? Um, and kind of related to that, I wanted to ask whether or not the accessibility of rights had to determine whether or not that right itself was universal. Uh, uh, sorry, thank you. Thank you for that uh, uh, question. Uh, if, I, if I may start with uh, your last uh, question about uh, the universality of, uh, of uh, rights. Uh, it either we stick to the rhetoric of universality and say rights are universal, uh, in my view, and uh, yet in practice, those rights are not actually enjoyed universally or globally. So that's the the way I would look at this idea and concept of uh, universality. Uh, and also from the point of view that all these norms and standards about childhood, Article 1, and uh, uh, these arbitrary uh, ages that are set, 18, et cetera, uh, these are not exactly derived from West, I mean, uh, global South conceptions of childhood. Uh, but what you're asking me is <laughs> uh, something that I would, would really want to do. Uh, I don't know. I'm keep, I keep getting messages. What I would really want to do in a, in a thorough sense, I just gave me, I just made references in passing to issues that are derived from rights that then are associated with issues like child labor, that are then associated with issues like uh, child marriage. Um, so that would require me, of course, to really sit down and tell you that this article, I just made a broad and tried to highlight the hypocr hypocrisy uh, of uh, international uh, child law in condemning certain practices, which they do. Okay, there is a history of child labor as well in these parts of the world. And yet in African societies, which are still underdeveloped, uh, the idea is they must really end it almost you know, uh, immediately. So the issues that I highlight there can be married to particular rights in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the, of the Child, physical integrity, circumcision, uh, for example, there are even reports about the benefits of uh, circumcision itself. Uh, yes, it, it, it's conceptualized it, in some cases as a violation of uh, physical integrity. So it is this kind of issues that need really considerate attention and see how we can navigate uh, these tensions. Thank you, Conrad. Benjamin, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I just, I, I, I thank you, Conrad. This is super interesting. I just, I just felt I needed to pick you up on one thing you said at the beginning, was that, was that, we, which, that we, there's an inequality of, um, of children's rights because in, you know, some, in some places, children don't have their rights fulfilled. There is no single country on the planet that has fully fulfilled the rights of children as set out in the CRC. And you would find that in the, uh, you know, in all of the, the, the CRC uh, committee reporting from all countries, there's criticism, you know, uh, we currently in the United Kingdom, I'm in New York, but I follow in the United Kingdom, there's a review of the care system of children in state care and the deprivation and the inequality and the absence of rights fulfillment for that group is a, an enormous challenge for the whole of society. So I think that, you know, child rights remain a global challenge that have to be addressed everywhere. We also see in the cases of trafficking and exploitation, we see grotesque uh, failure to protect the rights of children in every corner of the world. And it is a global uh, 
you know, is very much a, a global issue. I had a question in the chat box. Can I refer to that as well? Which was um, that countries from the global south were not included in the drafting extensively of the CRC. I don't know. I can't answer that. And the question was, what can we do to, to, to change that or readdress that now? And again, I really don't know, but I would urge everybody to use the tools we have to focus on outcome level issues. There are 13,000 children in the world that will die today because of preventable causes. There are, you know, one in uh, 10 children out of school today when they shouldn't be. Uh, we, these are the critical issues we need to to to, um, to to address, and I think that should be the heart of the country of the, the conversation. How can we achieve real outcomes and results for children? Thank you, Benjamin. Um, related to that, Amisa, I was wondering if um, I could ask about how active um, NGOs are in the reporting processes um, in Sri Lanka, in your experience. Um, thank you, Naomi. Um, I would say that there is some uh, activity around uh, reporting. I wouldn't say that there was a very high uh, level of activity. There are NGOs that are very working specifically on child rights issues that do engage. Um, I don't see the um, the uh, looking at the reports that have uh, or, or the ones that are publicly available that have have been made. Um, the kinds of issues that broadly kind of touch on, um, um, let, let's say like some of the more structural issues that Sri Lanka faces in terms of constitutional changes, uh, independent institutions, uh, things like that. We are reporting a lot of very um, issues that we need to be responding to. So child abuse, um, uh, child labor, exploitation, those kinds of issues. Um, there is some engagement, but um, I really do feel that there needs to be um, this environment that is also a part of the responsibility that we need to create for people to engage. Uh, it's not just NGOs, but also the people who can speak to NGOs. So those who are within affected communities, how do they actually overcome um, their communities uh, the challenges that they face at the very grassroots levels um, to share their stories that then thereafter get reported to the UNCRC. Thank you, Amiza. We, I have another question for you, if that's okay, um, to go straight into that one. Um, one question that was posed was that as Sri Lanka has ratified the UNCRC, how does that come into, how does that come into effect with regard to the Muslim law? or does it have no practical effect or impact? Sorry, the, the question was as, um, whether the UNCRC has a practical um, application in Sri Lanka with regard to the Muslim law? With regard to the Muslim law, as, it's been, as the UNCRC has been ratified. So uh, Sri Lanka follows this follows the dualist system, which says that we need to enact legislation that will then implement uh, our international obligations. Um, in relation to Muslim personal law, um, we have not um, done so. Uh, so law reform seems to be the um, the gate at which all of the advocacy in relation to Muslim law has got stuck. Um, so until we actually are able to make those justiciable rights in, in domestically, um, the application of the UNCRC is merely something that we do complain about to the UN committee, uh, and it, it, it stops there. Uh, it is used very much in that way uh, so that we can then hold the government accountable every time they do uh, report, uh, send their state reports in. But it is not a very, um, in my opinion, uh, in, and in the experience that I've had, it's not the strongest of tools. Uh, some of the more uh, bilateral economic agreements, uh, trade agreements tend to have stronger, um, uh, stronger uh, push over these issues than, than these reporting requirements. I hope that answered your question, uh, Naomi. Thank you very much. Um David, if I could ask you a question, segueing a little bit, um, I wanted to ask you about the role you saw of Article 5 
in providing some balance between this tension in article with article three and article 12 article five being um, that guidance and support should change with the evolving capacities of the child yeah i think one of the great uh, uh unanswered questions is the precise role of uh, guardians and parents according to the crc um look article 12 is clear about um evolving capacities um what it says is that you should recognize that a child becomes more capable of understanding uh, their own preferences, desires, and more capable of um, expressing those. Um, that, that, that seems to be already there in the article. The question is always going to be, well, how do you um, balance that, that recognition against a strong imperative to do what is in the best interest of the child? And then what you see is the role of uh, parents and guardians in providing direction or guidance to the child, but at the same time recognizes their evolving capacity. So I still think there's a tension. I'm not sure precisely how, how you mediate it. Thank you. Um, if I could uh, draw our attention now to um, a kind of a broader question of how to increase the effectiveness of the CRC. One thing that Benjamin mentioned at the beginning was that we've um, seen retrograde steps since COVID, despite seeing such progress um, since, since the CRC, um, and that there's still so much more to be done. Uh, so I wanted to ask, going forward, do we have to maintain existing gains, as was said, or do we need to look at progressing further against challenges such as the pandemic, but also um, uh, challenges such as climate change? Um, and how are we going to look to increase the effectiveness of the CRC um, over the next kind of 10 to 20, 30 years? Um, so Benjamin, perhaps you could start on that. Yeah, I'm just going to say that the two U's, I think universality and urgency. We need to come, we need to move away from these polarizing uh, conversations uh, and to see to, to 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 maintain an understanding of what we see as a common good for our children to understand more about the return on investment. You know, it's interesting that adverse childhood experiences, abuse and neglect are now known to be the main preventable cause of things like poor mental health, addiction and violence through the life course. And so we see that they cost North America and Europe alone, $1.3 trillion annually in health, poor health, health outcomes. So there are really robust arguments for addressing those things, investing early, and our intergenerational justice responsibility to use the resources we have today to stop those being a priority, uh, sorry, a, a, a challenge tomorrow. We have to um, also respond to the growing challenges, climate change, uh, increasing population we have to go back to unfinished business on child mortality and, and education uh, and I, I think we have to build up a new narrative or to go back to the old narrative that these things serve us all and these should be our priorities we need to strongly focus on outcomes and results and not tinker around on the edges of the debate Thank you. Amisa, how about you? Would you like to come in on the question of how to increase the effectiveness of the CRC? I mean, in, in just listening to the question, I was thinking, I really don't know. Um, it's, it's a very frustrating experience from where I am. Um, and, and I don't want to leave it on that, on that note. Um, it, the very many difficulties and challenges that I face, and I, and I do appreciate what, what Benjamin just said, um, the, the also the feeling amongst those who are trying really so hard to engage with these issues and bring about change, but also not, not talk about these uh, child rights is also spoken about in a very deep politicized way in Sri Lanka. Um, and then you don't engage with those long-term issues that also affect the, the subject of child rights, right? Um, I really find it very difficult to understand how we engage then with the UNCRC to make it more effective. How do we have that conversation? Um, I, I, must, uh, I must admit, I, I, I'm, I'm going to say that it's, it's a tough one for me. 
Thank you. Well, that draws us to the uh, to a close for today. Uh, we're out of time, so I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and uh, also to highlight that a link has been popped in the chat to future events in this in this series. Um, so please do uh, join us again um, in in a few weeks' time. Take care.